How to be an alien. Part 1. The most important rules. Chapter 1. A warning to beginners. In England, everything is different. You must understand that when people say England, they sometimes mean Great Britain, England, Scotland and Wales, sometimes the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, sometimes the British Isles, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But never just England. On Sundays in Europe the poorest person wears his best clothes and the life of the country becomes happy, bright and colorful. On Sundays in England the richest people wear their oldest clothes and the country becomes dark and sad. In Europe nobody talks about the weather in England, you have to say nice day, isn't it, about 200 times every day, or people think you are a bit boring. In Europe, you get Sunday newspapers on Monday. In England, a strange country, you get Sunday newspapers on Sunday. On a European bus, the driver uses the bell if he wants to drive on past a bus stop without stopping. In England, you use the bell when you want the bus to stop. In Europe, people like their cats. But in England, they love their cats more than their family. In Europe, people eat good food. In England, people think that good manners at the table are more important than the food you get to eat. The English eat bad food, but they say it tastes good. In Europe, important people speak loudly and clearly. In England, they learn to speak slowly and quietly so you cannot understand them. In Europe, clever people show that they are clever by talking about Aristotle, Horace and Montaigne. In England, only stupid people try to show how clever they are. The only people who talk about Latin and Greek writers are those who have not read them. In Europe, almost every country, big or small, fights wars to show they are the best. The English fight wars against those people who think they are the best. The English already know which country is really the best. Europeans cry and quickly get angry. Instead of this, the English just laugh quietly at their problems. In Europe, people are either honest with you or they lie to you. In England, people almost never lie, but they are almost never quite honest with you either. Many Europeans think that life is a game. The English think cricket is a game. Chapter 2 Introducing People This part of the book tells you how to introduce people to other people. Most importantly, when you introduce strangers, do not say their name so that the other person is able to hear it Usually, this is not a problem because nobody can understand your accent. If somebody introduces you to a stranger, there are two important rules to follow. 1. 
if he puts out his hand to shake yours, do not take it. Smile and wait. When he stops trying to shake your hand, try to shake his. Repeat this game all afternoon or evening. Quite possibly this will be the most amusing part of your afternoon or evening. 2. The introductions are finished and your new friend asks if you are well, how do you do? But do not forget, he doesn't really want to know. To him it doesn't matter if you are well or if you are dying of a terrible illness. Do not answer. Your conversation will be like this. He. How do you do? You. Quite good health. Not sleeping very well. Left foot hurts a bit. One or two stomach problems. A conversation like this is un-English and unforgivable. When you meet somebody, never say, pleased to meet you. English people think this is very rude. And one other thing. Do not call foreign lawyers, teachers, doctors, dentists, or shopkeepers, doctor. Everybody knows that the little word doctor means that you are a Central European. It is not a good thing to be a Central European in England, so you do not want people to remember. Chapter 3 The Weather This is the most important subject in the land. In Europe, people say, he is the type of person who talks about the weather to show that somebody is very boring. In England, the weather is always an interesting, exciting subject and you must be good at talking about it. Chapter 4 Examples for Conversations For good weather Nice day, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful? The sun isn't it wonderful? Yes, wonderful, isn't it? It's so nice and hot. I think it's so nice when it's hot, isn't it? I really love it, don't you? For bad weather. Terrible day, isn't it? Isn't it unpleasant? The rain, ah, oh, I don't like the rain. Just think, a day like this in July, it rains in the morning, then a bit of sun and then rain, rain, rain all day. I remember the same July day in 1936. Yes, I remember too. Or was it 1928? Yes, it was. Or in 1939? Yes, that's right. Now look at the last few sentences of this conversation. You can see a very important rule. You must always agree with other people when you talk about the weather. If it is raining and snowing and the wind is knocking down the trees and someone says, nice day, isn't it? Answer immediately, isn't it wonderful? Learn these conversations by heart. You can use them again and again. If you repeat these conversations every day for the rest of your life, it is possible that people will think you are clever, polite and amusing. Listen to the weather reports on the radio and you will hear different weather reports for different people. There is always a different report for farmers. For example, you hear, tomorrow it will be cloudy and cold. There will be a lot of rain. Then, immediately after this you hear, weather report for farmers, 
It will be bright and warm, and there will be a lot of sunshine. Farmers do important work for the country, so they need better weather, you see. Often the radio tells you that it is a nice day, but then you look outside and see that it is raining or snowing. Sometimes the radio says it is a rainy day, and you see that the sun is shining brightly. This is not because the weather people have made a mistake. It is because they have reported the right weather as they want it to be, but then some troublesome weather from another part of the world moves in across Britain and changes the weather picture. If British weather has to mix with foreign weather, things are not looking very good. Chapter 5 So, not quite saying what you mean. Foreigners have souls. The English do not have souls. In Europe, you find many people who look sad. This is soul. The worst kind of soul belongs to the Slav people. Slavs are usually very deep thinkers. They say things like this. Sometimes I'm so happy and sometimes I'm so sad. Can you explain why? You cannot explain. Do not try. Or perhaps they say, I want to be in some other place, not here. Do not say, I'd like you to be in some other place, too. All this is very deep. It is so, just so. But the English have no soul. Instead, they say less than they mean. For example, if a European boy wants to tell a girl that he loves her, he goes down on his knees and tells her she is the sweetest, most beautiful and wonderful person in the world. She has something in her, something special, and he cannot live one more minute without her. Sometimes, to make all this quite clear, he shoots himself. This happens every day in European countries, where people have so. In England, the boy puts his hand on the girl's shoulder and says quietly, You are all right, you know. If he really loves her, he says, I really quite like you, in fact. If he wants to marry a girl, he says, I say, would you? If he wants to sleep with her, I say, shall we? Chapter 6 Tea Tea was once a good drink. With lemon and sugar, it tastes very pleasant. But then the British decided to put cold milk and no sugar into it. They made it colorless and tasteless. In the hands of the English, tea became an unpleasant drink, like dirty water, but they still call it tea. Tea is the most important to drink in Great Britain and Ireland. You must never say, I don't want a cup of tea, or people will think that you are very strange and very foreign. In an English home, you get a cup of tea at five o'clock in the morning when you are still trying to sleep. If your friend brings you a cup of tea and you wake from your sweetest morning sleep, you must not say, I think you are most unkind to wake me up and I'd like to shoot you. You must smile your best five o'clock smile and say, 
Thank you so much. I do love a cup of tea at this time of the morning. When your friend leaves the room, you can throw the tea down the toilet. Then you have tea for breakfast. You have tea at 11 o'clock in the morning, then after lunch, then you have tea at tea time, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, then after supper, and again at 11 o'clock at night. You must drink more cups of tea if the weather is hot. If it is cold, if you are tired, if anybody thinks you are tired. If you are afraid, before you go out, if you are out, if you have just returned home, if you want a cup, if you do not want a cup, if you haven't had a cup for some time, if you have just had a cup. You must not follow my example. I sleep at five o'clock in the morning. I have coffee for breakfast. I drink black coffee again and again during the day. I drink strange and unusual teas with no milk at tea time. I have these funny foreign ways and my poor wife who was once a good English woman, now has them too, I'm sorry to say. Chapter 7 Sex European men and women have sex lives. English men and women have hot water bottles. Chapter 8 the language. When I arrived in England, I thought that I knew English. After I'd been here an hour, I realized I didn't understand one word. In my first week, I learned a little of the language, but after seven years, I knew that I could never use it really well. This is sad but nobody speaks English perfectly. Remember that those 500 words the ordinary Englishman uses most are not all the words in the language. You can learn another 500 and another 5000 and another 50,000 words after that and you will still find another 50,000 you have never heard of. Nobody has heard heard of them. If you live in England for a long time, you will be very surprised to find that the word nice is not the only adjective in the English language. For the first three years, you do not need to learn to use any other adjectives. You can say that the weather is nice, a restaurant is nice, Mr. So-and-so is nice, Mrs. So-and-so's clothes are nice, you had a nice time, and all this will be very nice. You must decide about your accent. You will have your foreign accent, all right, but many people like to mix it with another accent. I knew a Polish Jew who had a strong Yiddish-Irish accent. People thought he was very interesting. The easiest way to show that you have a good accent, or no foreign accent, is to hold a pipe or cigar in your mouth, to speak through your teeth and finish all your sentences with the question, isn't it? People will not understand you, but they will think that you probably speak very good English. Many foreigners try hard to speak with an Oxford accent. The city of Oxford has a famous university. If you have an Oxford accent, people think that you mix with clever people 
and that you are very intelligent. But the Oxford accent hurts your throat and is hard to use all the time. Sometimes you can forget to use it. Speak with your foreign accent and then where are you? People will laugh at you. The best way to look clever is to use long words, of course. These words are often old Latin and Greek words, which the English language has taken in. Many foreigners have learned Latin and Greek in school, and they find that a. it is much easier to learn these words than the much shorter English words. b. These words are usually very long and make you seem very intelligent when you talk to shopkeepers and postmen. But be careful with all these long words. They do not always have the same meaning as they once had in Latin or Greek. When you know all the long words, remember to learn some short ones, too. Finally, there are two important things to remember. 1. Do not forget that it is much easier to write in English than to speak English, because you can write without a foreign accent. 2. On a bus or in the street, it is better to speak quietly in good German than to shout loudly in bad English. Anyway, all this language business is not easy. After eight years in this country, a very kind woman told me the other day, You speak with a very good accent, but without any English. Chapter 9 How not to be clever You foreigners are so clever, a woman said to me some years ago. I know many foreigners who are stupid. I thought she was being kind, but not quite honest. Now I know that she was not being kind. These words showed that she didn't like foreigners. Look at the word clever in any English dictionary. These dictionaries say clever means quick, intelligent. These are nice adjectives, but the dictionaries are all a little out of date. A modern Englishman uses the word clever to mean possibly a bit dishonest, un-English, un-Scottish, and Welsh. In England, it is bad manners to be clever or proud of your intelligence. Perhaps you know that two and two make four. But you must never say that to and to make four. The Englishman is shy and quiet. He doesn't show that he is clever. He uses few words, but he says a lot with them. A European, for example, looks at a beautiful place and says, This place looks like you tracked where a war ended on the 11th of April, 1713. The river over there is like the Guadalquivir in the Sierra de Cazorla and is 650 kilometers long. It runs southwest to the Atlantic Ocean. Rivers. What does so and so say? Did I tell you about... You cannot speak like this in England. An Englishman looks at the same place. He is silent for two or three hours and then he says, It's pretty, isn't it? An English girl, of course, understands it's not clever to know if Budapest is the capital city of Romania, Hungary or Bulgaria. It is so much nicer to ask 
when someone speaks of Barbados, Banska Bystrica or Fiji. Oh, those little islands! Are they British? Once they usually were. Chapter 10 How to be rude It is easy to be rude in Europe. You just shout and call people animal names. To be very rude, you can make up terrible stories about them. In England, people are rude in a very different way. If somebody tells you an untrue story, in Europe you say, You are a liar, sir. In England, you just say, Oh, is that so? Or, that's quite an unusual story, isn't it? A few years ago, when I knew only about 10 words of English and used them all wrong, I went for a job. The man who saw me said quietly, I'm afraid your English is a bit unusual. In any European language, this means kick this man out of the office. A hundred years ago, if somebody made the Sultan of Turkey or the Tsar of Russia angry, they cut off the person's head immediately. But when somebody made the English Queen angry, she said, We are not amused. And the English are still, to this day, very proud of their Queen for being so rude. Terribly rude things to say are, I'm afraid that, how strange that, and I'm sorry, but you must look very serious when you say these things. It is true that sometimes you hear people shout, get out of here, or shut your big mouth, or dirty pig, etc. This is very un-English. Foreigners who lived in England hundreds of years ago probably introduced these things to the English language. Chapter 11. How to compromise. For the British, compromise is very important. Compromise means that you bring together everything that is bad. For example, English people agree to go to a party, but then do not speak to anyone. In an English house, you can see that the English compromise. It is all right for their houses to have walls and a roof, but they must be as cold inside as the garden outside. It is all right to have a fire in an English home. But if you sit in front of it, your face is hot, but your back is cold. It is a compromise. It answers the problem of how to burn and catch a cold at the same time. In an English pub, you can have a drink at five minutes after six but you cannot have a drink at five minutes before six. This is a compromise to drink too much between three o'clock and six o'clock in the afternoon. You must stay at home. The English language is a compromise between sensible, easy words and words which nobody understands. A visit to the cinema is a compromise. You must queue uncomfortably for three hours to get inside the cinema so that you can be comfortable for one hour during the film. English weather is a compromise between rain and snow. In fact, almost everything about life in England is a compromise. Chapter 12. How to be a hypocrite. 
If you want to be really and truly British, you must become a hypocrite. Now, how do you become a hypocrite? As some people say, an example explains things best. I'll try this way. I was having a drink with an English friend in a pub. We were sitting on high chairs near the bar when suddenly there was a fight and some shooting in the street. I was truly and honestly frightened. A few seconds later, I looked for my friend, but I couldn't see him anywhere. At last I saw that he was lying on the floor. When he realized we were safe in the pub, he stood up. He turned to me and smiled. Good God, he said, you were frightened. You didn't even move. Chapter 13 Small Pleasures It is important to learn to enjoy small pleasures because that is terribly English. All serious Englishmen play cricket and other games. During the war, the French thought the English were childish because they played football and children's games when they were not fighting. Boring and important foreigners cannot understand these small pleasures. They ask, why do important men in the British government stand up and sing children's songs? Why do serious businessmen play with children's trains while their children sit in the next room learning their lessons? Why more than anything else do grown-up people want to hit a little ball into a small hole? This is a very popular sport in England. Why are the great men in government who saved England in the war only called quite good men? Foreigners want to know why do English people sing when nobody is in the room? If somebody is in the room, the English will stay silent for months. Chapter 14 Favorite Things In England, people do not often get excited. They do not enjoy many things, but they love to queue. In Europe, if people are waiting at a bus stop, they look bored and half asleep. When the bus arrives, they fight to get on it. Most of them live on the bus, and some are very lucky and live in an ambulance. One Englishman waits at a bus stop, and even if there are no other people there, he starts a queue. The biggest and best queues are in front of cinemas. These queues have large cards that say Queue here for 4S 6D. Queue here for 9S 3D. Queue here for 16S 8D. Nobody goes to a cinema if it doesn't have cards telling customers to queue. At weekends, an Englishman queues up at the bus stop, travels out to Richmond, queues up for a boat, then queues up for tea, then queues up for ice cream, then queues up some more because it is fun, then queues up at the bus stop when he wants to go home. He has a very good time. Many English families spend pleasant evenings at home just by queuing for a few hours. The parents are very sad when the children leave them and queue up to go to bed. Chapter 15 Remember If you go for a walk with a friend in England, don't say a single word for hours. 
if you go for a walk with your dog, talk to it all the time. Thank you.